Hello, everyone. How are you today? We are here with the incredible Terry, and she is a professional painter who has agreed to help us out by teaching us how to paint a few of our minis. And that is her on the screen. You can see her picture right now. Um, but she has her camera set up to be perfect for streaming this and showing you how to paint. It is not perfect for having you look at her face at the moment. So it's, she... it's actually better too, because I look like this when I'm like being a person, <laughs> but I usually look like this when I'm painting. So it's not <laughs> ideal. Oh, that's so hilarious. <laughs> Oh it's goodness. so awesome to be here. I'm so glad there are people in the chat excited and enthusiastic. This is going to be a really fun time. Um, I, I'm looking forward to it, and I, I hope you guys are, are too. Oh, yeah. They have been super pumped for this, so we are really lucky to have you. Um, so tell us, what are you painting this afternoon? I am painting the pumpkin wrapper. It's... Um, I know uh, Simon in the chat was asking about it. This is kind of what I uh, I envision him looking like. I'm gonna show you how to get to here and maybe maybe a few tips and techniques of just general mini painting uh, as we get to, to here uh, over this stream. So it's gonna be really fun. It's gonna be really light. And the thing I wanna really emphasize is that you can do this. Like if you've never uh, painted mini before, you can do this. It's really easy and it's really, um, it's it's not as hard or as scary as you think. And I think that one of the things that I really enjoyed painting these minis is the scale of these minis is really fantastic for new painters. It's fantastic for new painters because it is, I'd say that it's about twice the size of, of um, kind of the standard minis you see in, in board games or, or mini games. Um, and that means that the details aren't as tiny and it's a lot more forgiving for that. And you can, you can really just enjoy the process and learn as you go. That's awesome. Yeah, I think that he's a great mini for all of this. Um, so we do have some great questions going in chat right now. Um, but I think that if we just get started, you're gonna be able to tell us everything from the beginning to the very end of the process of what you did. So what's the very first thing that you do when you start getting ready to paint? Okay, so I primed this miniature uh, with uh, some model primer. This is Citadel's Corks White. You can find it at most hobby stores. It is a really fantastic product. Uh, when you get your miniature, I know someone mentioned in, in the chat already, you do want to wash them. Um, washing them takes off any model release agents on there. And that that model release agent, which, you know, helps remove the model from the mold, uh, doesn't make for really great adhesion of the paint to the miniature. So put them in some tepid water uh, and put a little bit of dish soap in them. That's what I use because ultimately that stuff cuts grease and it keeps your hands soft in the meantime. And it, you know, give them a rinse after you've, you've given them a, a quick wash. Uh, you can take like a, a soft toothbrush to them and just get it in the little crevices because that's usually where, where that agent sticks as well. And then, and then let, let them dry. You can, you know, just let them air dry and, and they're pretty much good to go. After that, throw on a coat of the primer. Um, there's instructions on how to use this really want to follow them. Well-ventilated area is a really big deal. Uh, you don't want to be breathing in any of that paint. And you also want to do it in thin coats. Sometimes you won't get like a perfect coat on the miniature in the first, the first time you try it. Um, but the second, like the second coat will be fine. And if, if you work in thin layers, and that's going to be a theme as we paint this miniature. If you work in thin layers, you're going to uh, keep the detail while also putting the color and the pigment on the miniature. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, orange. Um, and this is Formula P3's Keto Red Highlight. Now, don't let the names of paints throw you off. Look at the paint and determine if that's the color you want. Uh, all of the paints I'm using, you can probably find comparables um, in any line, whatever is most accessible to you. But I do want to emphasize that when it comes to painting miniatures, getting a good quality hobby paint is, 
is the thing you really want to invest in. Um, there's two things you want to spend your money on when it comes to the hobby, and that's miniatures and paint. Um, so th those are the things you definitely want to you definitely want to do. And I'm just pulling some paint out of the lid and putting it on a wet palette right now. Um, I'm gonna bump up the light a little bit so you can see a little bit better. There we go. Um, and uh, let me see if I can adjust the focus here as I hold him and you can see a little bit clearer what I'm doing. Perfect. Hey, Terry, we have a question about what kind of brushes you're using. Do you want to talk about that quick? Sure. Um, I have a mix of brushes here. Uh, people who who might have uh, checked out my YouTube channel might know that I'm a, I'm a, a lover of cheap brushes. Um, I do have some some older brushes, some artist brushes from, you know, the art store, watercolor sections. I have a couple um, sable brushes, but I don't necessarily think that they're necessary for painting models of this scale. I, I do want to emphasize that the best um, brush is the one that's comfortable in your hand and is one you can control. So, you know, if you're starting out, you don't have to feel like you have to spend like 20 or $30 on a brush. Uh, most hobby stores sell you know, great brushes with great value in them. Um, and they'll, they'll take you a long ways. And again, with the size of these models, this is, we're looking at models that stand about two inches. Most um, miniatures in other ranges will stand half that. And so you'll see people buying these tiny, tiny brushes with tips that look like pens. Um, if you actually look at some of the brushes I'm using now, they're they're rather large comparatively um, versus like these, these super, super tiny brushes here. Um, that's pretty significant in terms of size. Um, and I, I do that because like, I, I think that when it comes to putting paint on models, especially with the large um, size of the model, it's easier to use a large brush and paint those wide surfaces. Um, and then, you know, find a brush that works for the details if you choose to paint them. So I am going to start with a little bit of the orange. I'm gonna water it down a little bit, but um, depending on the consistency of your paint, you wanna take it down to the consistency of like whole milk or cream, something that's fluid, um, but when you pull it on your palette is you know pretty, pretty straight, it doesn't beat out. And I'm gonna start painting the orange on this miniature. So um, I Terry, I have a quick question for you. Somebody certainly. in chat was wondering, why did you prime it white instead of black or okay. gray? So, Ultimately, this is one of those things where uh, it comes down to the fact that I'm a lazy painter. I am someone who likes to to do do the steps that I want to do to get something done and on the table that I can be proud of. But you know, putting on multiple layers can be time consuming. So I paint white on stuff that is vibrantly colored, oftentimes, um, and because of that, uh, because the colors of this particular miniature and a lot of the Power Range, Power Ranger minis, like they have super bright, super exaggerated colors. When you paint white, um, those colors show up like immediately. Uh, if you're priming with a color like black, uh, it tends to require uh, more layers for the coverage, for the colors to show up as vibrantly. Um, and honestly, if you look at this character, I'm not going to be too worried about trying to to build up the shadows because where the two colors, the pre predominant colors of this miniature meet, that's where those shadows are going to be anyways. So when you mix the green with the orange on the miniature, it actually builds a, a shadow on it anyway. So that's why I primed white. Um, Again, if you're finding that that you want to prime black, there are a lot of great reasons to prime black. One of the reasons is if you if you have a really uh, detailed miniature where there's lots of places that are really hard for brush like a brush to get into, um, it can be a real pain. And when you prime black, those shadows are already black for you, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, it's pretty forgiving primer color. But with white, um, I like the vibrancy on this particular. Um, color set. And again, fewer layers to build up that bright, bright orange and that bright green that we're going to be using today. That is looking really fantastic. So again, what was the name of this color that you're using? This is Kador Red Highlight from Formula P3. It's, again, when you look at um, 
the paint ranges, uh, whatever is available to you, look at them in the bottle. Like, you know, go to your, your hobby store and look, look at the paint. Um, sometimes names can be kind of deceiving. This is obviously not a red. Um, so don't, don't paint it as if it, or don't assume just because a model paint color says a, a specific thing that it's meant for that. Uh, there are a lot of colors out there that, um, seem like they're descriptive colors like beast hide or um flesh tones those are you know shades of brown so when i look at paints when, that i'm picking up if i want a brown i'm looking for a specific brown to my eye not necessarily uh the name um or a purpose for it because those names can be really limiting so i noticed that you're doing all of the areas that you are going to want orange right now. And then you'll probably go back and do different things later. How do you choose what Absolutely. to do first? So um, I I typically try to paint from the inside out. So uh, the, the, the deepest layers, things that would be behind stuff, um, tends to be the first color I paint. I'm also, if you notice, I'm not being particularly precious. I'm getting orange <laughs> kind of everywhere uh, because paint is its own white out. Uh, and so when I paint my base coat on, uh, the first color I paint is often the messiest. And so uh, the, the, the stages of which a miniature looks good is, is really, it's a bit of a, a curve um, that goes up and down. Uh, as, you, as you start on a miniature, it starts looking kind of weird. And when you're at the 60% the stage or so, between 60 and 80%, Sometimes miniatures look really terrible. They're, they're, they're not looking the way they should. That's okay. <laughs> Just keep going. Um, when you get to the end point, that's when the miniature comes together. So I'm putting orange just like basically everywhere there is orange. And there's a lot of orange on this miniature. So so I'm putting it basically everywhere. I, I, I know there's going to be orange. I'm kind of making sure I meet where the other colors will be. So the, where the green is, I'm over painting those borders just a little bit. And the reason I'm doing that is especially on white primer, but also like on any any base coat, if you've got a miniature where you have a border, so between where the vines meet and the orange meets, if I painted right up to that line and then tried to match that line with the green, I am very likely to either uh, get a like a white like border line that'll show through because it's really hard to match perfectly those lines, um, and it's just it 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 take it really does it just takes longer. Um, whereas paint, if you treat it like its own whiteout, um, it can really it can really you know open up the uh, the idea of like you know just painting and being forgiving as you go and then cleaning up afterwards with that second second color and second coat. So you can always go in on top of a color and paint that color on top. And that's that's kind of the big thing is just, you know, just go on top. And with this miniature specifically, if you actually look at pictures of Pumpkin Wrapper, he is, he's got all sorts of uh, color, color modeling around him. The borders of his, his um, colors aren't exactly clean. There's green on the orange it's everywhere right uh and it's kind of I, i'm assuming that the costume designer saw how how plants grow right when when pumpkins start their their green and they're kind of mottled and and the orange shows through afterwards so i'm i'm taking a cue from that as well right the idea when you paint miniatures you should be able to enjoy the process of it and and ultimately you know you know feel good at the end but you don't want to make it so that it's a frustrating experience for yourself. And ultimately when you paint, you know, being forgiving and not trying to be too precious, especially on the first coat, you'll, you'll find the, the process more enjoyable. And you'll also find that you, you pick up speed as you go. So that's what's happening here right now. It's, it's a lot of orange, so I'll, <laughs> I'll be the first to admit. Well, this is also super helpful because for all of you there in the all-in pledge, you get over 130 models and that's a lot of stuff to paint. So doing it a, is going to be a more enjoyable experience. I mean, I think that's that's one of the things when I when I see games that have like great, exciting, dynamic models, um, you know, playing the game with 
with friends is fantastic, but you can get a little bit more enjoyment out of it, even when you're by yourself, if you decide to take on painting them. And then when your 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 friends come over and you you get the game out on the table again, um, it's an it's it's not much more of an immersive experience, but it's also a a, a way for you to express, you know, your passion and and your enthusiasm for the game as well. So it's it's a really it's it's like extra value is how I like to think of it. It is more of something you can do in your time in between games. So that's great. Yeah. So Terry, I actually had another question for you. So you've been a lifelong Power Rangers fan. I know you and I talked about that a little bit yesterday. So do you want to tell our backers a little bit about that? Hi. So I have loved Power Rangers since it first came on air. It It's a, such a meaningful um, show to me because it was one of the first shows that I remember seeing someone who looked like me on television being like a cool hero, being um, a martial artist, actually. Um, Trini is one of the reasons why I took up martial arts as a child. Um, it was a it was a it was a really exciting thing to not see uh, a a like see a hero, an actual hero um, who looked like me on 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 anywhere really at that point. Um, and it's really interesting thing now because I have a nine year old uh, daughter. And so now I'm at a point where I'm sharing Power Rangers with her and she's coming into it. And she, you know, I, I don't think she honestly had a chance to not be a, a geek. Um, and so so she's enjoying Power Rangers and this new generation of, of, of fans. Um, although, uh, when I showed her some of the pumpkin wrapper uh, clips I could find, she was she was just like, like, he's cool. He, really? He's cool? And I'm like, listen, listen, kid. Back then, rap was a different thing. And, and so like, true. rhyming was really fun. But, like, it was just, it was a lot of fun, right? It's a lot of fun. And I think that's what, what I loved about the show is that it was, you know, it was, it was just a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. It didn't take itself too seriously, you know, in in the sense that the villains were, you know, a little bit a little bit kitschy, and that's cool, um, because you know it was such an exaggerated experience, right? Like, um, it was it was a lot of the kind of the idea of like anime in live action, um, a lot of those those uh, tropes and and the things that that you you loved seeing um, in those exciting, you know, shows. You got to see live, and it was really cool. And also, like, honestly, some of the the fights. I remember. I remember seeing um, some of my first martial art fights because they didn't really have a lot of um, a lot of kung fu movies for kids, right? It's not <laughs> something that they that wasn't a market at the time that they were that they were catering to. So like my first exposure to like martial arts on the screen was also Power Rangers. The choreography was pretty fun and pretty exciting. And and as a kid, I remember watching it thinking, wow, this is this is terrific. <laughs> it is very silly. I like that about it too. It is. I mean, and it not everything has to be super grim or super, super like just just dark. Um, I think that it's we can love things that are that are unapologetically, you know, good and moral. And like the 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 messaging of the show when I was growing up was so positive. And that like that was really that's something that that stuck with me. The idea of like you know, you know, even even seeing um, the Rangers in their they're not ranger gear dealing with bullies and dealing with with that sort of stuff it's just super positive and i think that 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 really stuck with me too and I, I i loved it i just i loved all of it yeah power rangers are super fun that way so what's your nine-year-old's favorite ranger uh you know what i think that so when i i I watched the the old shows with her because I just wanted to share it with her, and she, she, I think she has a crush on Billy. I I don't know. This is probably going to come back at me at some point. I'm just I'm the embarrassing mom on the internet now because um, he's really smart, right? Like he's really smart, but also like like he can 
he can fight and that's really cool and i uh, you know in all honesty i think that like um the the tradition of of the color coded personalities a little bit um i think she she sees that she sees that patterning um so you know the red leader um and like the blue the blue second or lieutenant who is actually probably if if in all honesty he'd probably be a better leader because he's smarter he's less you know you know he's less uh rash than than the red leader like those things those are tropes that she connects with and so i think i think that's probably a little bit it as well awesome well it's looking pretty good how much more orange do you have to do not a lot so what we're going to be doing now is we're going to be doing a lot of waiting <laughs> um painting brush to model time is very different than like actual like uh painting time because we want to make sure this layer is dry before we put uh, a next color on um mostly because the water if two wet paints meet they will um meld uh the color will get muddied together so that's what we're looking at here and that's something we kind of want to avoid um i'm gonna actually touch up a little points here but ultimately it's it's just about letting it dry now i'm gonna i'm gonna see if i can get obscenely close excuse me here um and so what will happen to the paint is you can kind of see it's got a sheen to it where it's wet so like on the pumpkin on his hand it's pretty wet and where it's drying it'll become more and more matte and that's that's normal so you'll be able to tell you know, just by looking at the model, um, if it's dry or if it's wet. And um, the other thing that you'll want to be aware of is sometimes you have to do two coats um, because uh, depending on how pigmented your paint is, how much you thin it down, sometimes it shrinks. So what happens to paint is it starts as this, this, um, this liquid, but it dries and it dries and turns to basically a layer of plastic, right? And so, if it if you if it's got a lot of water in it or if the pigments um aren't as um fine and the concentration is is not as high as it you know could be because you've watered it down um sometimes you'll notice that the paint will kind of pull away from itself there'll be parts that that you know you touched with a brush and you know you put paint on it but you know the paint will kind of pull away from itself as it dries so so keep an eye out for that um as you go and so two thin coats is is usually a better way to go anyways you'll get better coverage you'll maintain the detail on the miniature and you don't have to to fuss about too much um i'm going to just touch up here now the other thing i really want to emphasize especially if you're new to painting is paint what you can see and don't worry about the stuff you can't really see um so like um I'm going to focus a lot of my attention when it comes to the next colors, you know, at the top, the minis, the miniatures where you can see it from the front, the back, and from the top. I'm not going to pay too much attention to, for example, the vines in between his legs here. I'm going to put some paint on it, but I'm not going to kill myself trying to get everything perfect or exact because those are parts you won't see on other models based on their sculpts. Now I have, and I'm going to probably do a quick, a quick, preview for those of you who are seen for the miniatures on the underneath side right like so if you're looking at the you know the bottoms of you know this model here when he's on the table you won't see him so trying to focus on details that are on the bottom of a miniature that you're less likely to see is like painting the bottom of the base is what i say um and so so, so i don't spend that time we did actually have a question about the base. Um, if you want to answer that while you're waiting for it to dry, somebody was wondering if you're going to paint that base or if you have a recommendation for painting it. Um, so I painted it just because it's the way I clean up where, so if you look, you know, I get, I get paint everywhere. I'm a messy painter. Um, again, mostly because I'm not precious about where my paint goes. Cause I, I know I'm going to probably put another coat of paint on it. I painted the base here using a color that I used on the stem of the pumpkin, um, just because that was the paint I had on hand. Uh, and and afterwards you can add texture or flock to it. Uh, these miniatures, you know, they're, the contact points are really solid on the bases, but if you do take like, even an X-Acto knife, you can take them off the base and then do additional stuff on, on the base if you wanna put some grass flock on there, um, which you can pick up at your hobby store 
I mean, you know, chances are if they sell miniature paints, they, they sell basing materials and it looks like grass and it'll look great. Um, you can put some, um, a mix of sand and white glue, layer that on and then paint that so you have some texture on there. It's really up to you, right? Like, I like to say that the base is like, the base is to the mini what a frame is to a painting. So it can really emphasize uh, and make a miniature pop. And, and that's ultimately what we're looking to do here. So very cool. So here is, here's the orange, there's the orange on there. I'm going to talk a little bit about my palette, though, if you guys are interested in that. Oh, um, they are. They wanted to know what your what paints you're using for sure. All right. So we have, um, so I've got like the, the setup here I have is the majority of the paint is going to be um, Kit a Red Highlight, which again, we've established is not red. It's actually like this bright orange. And um, IOs in green. Uh, these are from uh, the Formula P3 line. Um, you can get them at most hobby stores. Um, but again, if you're shopping for hobby paint, look at the colors and, and find the colors. So really what we're working with is a bright orange and a kind of grass green. Um, and then after that, I have a wash. And this is um, Fuegan Orange Wash from Citadel. This is a this is a big bottle. Um, and it's a lot of wash. It'll go a long, long way. Um, you could probably even use like a, a really light, like a lighter brown wash. There, there are other lines that have like lighter brown washes. And the browner washes will be a little more versatile for you if that's something you're interested in. But on the orange, I think that, that the wash really does pop without making it look muddy. Um, so that's why I love this stuff. Um, and I have a couple other additional colors. So the the base and the the top of the pumpkin that I used on here is beast hide. Now you'll notice it's neither a beast nor hide. I'm just finding a brown that works for <laughs> the the stem of a pumpkin. Um, so it's this light kind of tan brown color. Um, and I've got Earth Fire here, which is like a, a, a yellow. It's not like super neon yellow. It's got a little bit of a, a golden tone to it, um, but it, it's nice and and solid. Um, and I've got uh, Necrotite Green, which I'm gonna use uh, with the other green to, to make the green pop on the miniature afterwards. Um, you can take a miniature to whatever stage you want. You don't have to feel like you have to to paint every little detail. And so if you want to just paint the stem orange and say, hey, done, or paint it green, you've got green, hey, done. Why not? So um, it looks like someone asked, Curtis was asking about my palette. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so yeah, we can talk a little bit about how my palette is, uh, I just have a container here um, with, it's a plastic container with sides. Uh, I put a layer of paper towel down and then I put some, this is parchment paper you get when you go to like, uh, I picked this up at the dollar store, but the stuff you put on cookie sheets when you don't want them to stick. Um, and it's just baking paper. So so the, the, you know, parchment baking paper and I put some water on the paper towel, laid a, a piece of the parchment paper on it and that is my palette. It's a wet palette. Uh, it keeps my paints from drying out and it makes it so I don't have to add as much water to the paint because it's pulling some paint from, from my palette. Now the box itself, uh, this is another one I have. The box itself is just like, a, I have one with a lid and when I bought it, it came with chocolates in it, <laughs> which it's a which bonus. really, yeah, like it's like a bonus, right? So um, <laughs> you can get like artist palettes um, that have like, working paper in them and a sponge and that sort of thing. Um, I, I'm i personally partial to chocolate. And so that was what I was looking for in my, my container. Yeah. I've seen people use, um, you know, Ziploc containers for their wet palettes. You know, you don't have to spend a ton of money on, on your painting supplies um, other than, you know, investing in good paint and investing in the models themselves. Like save your dollars for minis, so that, that, that's the thing that I really, I think is is worthwhile. You wanna buy more toys in the end, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. 
Um, so that is what I've I've got here. The orange looks like it's getting to a point where it's dry, and I'm gonna I'm gonna actually oops I'm gonna start pulling paint onto my palette. Some people were asking about my holder as well. This was a holder from Citadel. Um, they made these holders, but honestly, if you paint, you know, I painted for years holding my mini by the base, and that works pretty well. Um, I've also done it where you just take some double stick tape and like a paint and you can like tab it on, you have like a little holder or like a, a can or the lid of your primer that works as well too. It's nice to have something to hold sometimes because you don't want to touch wet paint while you're you're painting. Um, double stick tape, poster tack, those are all like really cheap, easy ways to, to make yourself a paint holder out of what you have, right? Um, so that that's kind of a, a, a big thing as well. I, I think in the past I've actually used old, old wine bottles and whiskey bottles, you know, because it has a nice handle and it's heavy um, because ultimately you just don't want to knock your miniature off. So yeah, that's what we've got over here. Um, there's kind of a theme to a lot of what I do when, when I paint. It's, you know, my hobby tools tend to have food inside of them <laughs> and that's okay. Like I'm cool with that. Now, if you're using a, a palette like this, you can, you know, you don't have to, when I started out, um, with palettes and even working with a dry palette for things um, is is like reusing stuff you have. So uh, when I, my painting setup for a long time was like an old margarine container where I take the lid off, that would be my palette. And the 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 body of the container itself was my, my, my water holder. And I just go from there. And you know, you don't, you don't have to invest a ton into these little tools, right? Um, so Chris was asking about uh, mistakes on the miniature without ruining the miniature. Uh, there's a couple ways that I have dealt with mistakes. Now, first is if you treat paint as its own whiteout, you'll be fine. Like that's 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 the thing. Um, other times, just put the mini down and look at it. Is it really a mistake? Can someone tell from from you know three feet away? Because you're gonna be playing with these these miniatures. If someone can tell from three feet away, you know, hey, eh, maybe that, you know, I, I can touch up that up with a little bit of paint. But honestly, chances are those little, you know, those little points where where you you might have gone a little bit over by like half a millimeter. Nobody's gonna know, I assure you. What you're seeing on your screen right now is probably larger than you will ever see a miniature ever. Um, because we play with these. These are these are these are our 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 toys, right? Like they they as as uh, components to a game. We handle them. You you have to take your miniatures to a point where you're happy with the way they look. But if someone were to knock it off the table, like a cat or a human, <laughs> can you still like you know finish your game and be happy about that? It's one of the reasons why I I describe myself as a as a lazy painter. It's because. I want to put the time into my miniatures. You know, that time is for me. That time is for me to enjoy um, as I apply paint. But I'm not going to spend so much time painting miniatures that if something were to happen to a miniature, I would be totally heartbroken, right? You want to be proud, but you don't want to be like to the point where you're so attached that you forget that these are these are for a game and that game is really what you you want to play right like that that's that's the big deal so i'm going to start with the green now and i'm going to start applying it on the vines and the leaves and everything and again you can see i i'll i'll focus i'll adjust the focus here so you can see it real close see just how yeah i was wow. not precious about where i put that paint like it's all over the place and i'm cool with that that's going to be okay because ultimately, you know, the green's gonna go on it. The green is gonna cover up any of the orange that has gone uh, beyond its its borders. This is not like fourth grade coloring, right? I'm not the teacher who's gonna wrap your knuckles for going outside the lines. Um, when you paint miniatures, what you're doing essentially is you're, you're an impressionist painter. So you're giving the impression of vines and you're painting on the impression of light and the impression of, of shadow but you're not we're not asking for photorealism on a miniature because ultimately the when when you're enjoying these miniatures in the end you're going to be three four or five feet away from them um tabletop distance means that while you're painting them this miniature is maybe six eight 
10 inches from your face. But, you know, honestly, at the time when you're, you're actually enjoying it, you'll never be that close. You will never be that close. Well, I can so also give yourself say that, that space. looking at the whole table with all of your miniatures painted because you did them all in a way that makes them at least colorful and looks, looks great. Then yeah. you're going to have a whole entire table full of painted miniatures instead of just one that you're really, really happy with. So I exactly. would just go and just paint them and, and see how it goes. <laughs> and exactly. you can always just go put, back. Yeah, you can always go back. Now, I never say a miniature is like perfect. When, you know, when, I, when I say a miniature is done, it's just because I'm at that point I'm done. But you can always, always, always go back, add more detail later on. Um, you know, after the screen is on at the color block stage, you know, you can stop. You can say, you know what, I'm... I'm happy with the way he looks now. I, I'm, I'm ready to just put him on the table and get him going. You, you are painting, you're painting a character, but you're also, you know, painting the impression of the color and, and the, the, the blocks of it. And you'll, you'll see it on the table, like just having something that isn't gray plastic is, is, is going to make a difference. It absolutely does. And when you've got like all of these miniatures on the board, you know, the immersion, Nothing has to be perfect. It just has to be there to help help your imagination immerse you in that world, right? So, um, so we actually have a pretty good question in chat. So Thomas was wondering, um, the rangers actually come in their colors. So you're going to have the red ranger be bright red plastic, blue ranger, same thing, be bright blue. So how would you recommend priming those? Oh, okay. So I have if you're looking to keep that color and that's a great idea absolutely um i have this product here this is a uh, testers uh they call it spray lacquer but they have a couple products one is a gloss one is a dull coat so that's dull coat it's clear and the dull coat uh creates a surface on the miniature that uh, paint can adhere to uh this is the product i actually use when I'm done a miniature, I'll spray it on at the end to protect it uh, because the oil from your hands will break down the paint. It does break down the paint. And um, if you're handling these because you're playing games with them, um, you know, you want to put a protective layer on the paint so that it doesn't, doesn't come off on your hands. Um, but it also works as a great primer for, for paints that you're doing where you want to put like uh, a coat on, but you like the color itself. Very so, cool. Yeah, that's, so, that's, that's, that's so you it. would just essentially clear prime it and then you would paint whatever color you want on top of that. You wouldn't worry about going over it with something like a white primer. Uh, you know, it depends on, you know, for the Rangers, I'll likely be priming them um, white just for myself because I, I find that it's easier to uh, for me to put those bright colors on a white or a gray, a light, a light gray rather than um, trying to to put a white on top of like a darker color that's already there. And that, mm -hmm. that's kind of the difference, right? Um, but it's all personal preference, what you have on hand. Um, you don't have to feel like you have to buy a million products, right? <laughs> Use what you have. Uh, sometimes, you know, if, if you don't want to pick up a new primer, that's fine. You know, just use what you've got. Put a second coat on if that's, that's what you need to do. And, and, you know, just keep going. You know, you can keep putting on another thin layer and another thin layer until you're happy with, with the outcome. Definitely. I think that's great advice. So we're just painting on the green here. I'm painting on the vines. Uh, he's got like this bow on the front of him. But, you know, these are the two colors of this miniature. This is the predominant color. And, and yeah, it's pretty easy. Like, this is a really forgiving uh, miniature. So if this is one of the first miniatures you paint out of the case, if you've never painted a miniature before, this is a really fun one to do again, because like the, the colors aren't, you don't have to be as precise with them. You don't have to be, uh, you don't have to feel like, you know, you have to be perfect with everything. This is a really forgiving model. And I think a, a lot of the, a lot of people who are new might feel like, um, everything has to be perfect. But when you start with a miniature like this, the next miniature you paint will be better. And the next miniature you paint after that, it'll be better. I've never been able to paint two miniatures exactly the same when I've painted them in succession. Um, and that's a good thing, right? Like it means that I'm growing and I'm improving, I'm learning things and I'm, 
I'm trying new things out as well. So, uh, you know, just play with it a little bit and don't, don't be intimidated, right? So I actually own a hobby store and I've owned it for 13 years. And so I've seen a lot of people get into painting and I've done that myself and it's been a really enjoyable experience. But one thing I always tell people is no matter what model you start with, leave it like once you're done with that model save it forever just to remind yourself how much better you get because like you just said every single model you paint you get in a lot better and that very first one when you look at it it's still amazing that you could do what you did but you'll get so much better that it'll it'll look kind of silly eventually but it's a good reminder I mean I think that that's one of those things where I, I know people who have told me, you know, I've never been able to get over the hump. Like I'll start a miniature and I'll keep, I'll just keep picking at it. And, you know, the thing I tell them is, or I ask them is just like, you know, what's your goal? Is your goal to have a perfect miniature or a done miniature and to improve? Cause you will never get better if you keep painting the same miniature. You'll never learn new things if you keep going over and back again. Oh, so, so you'll see here, I. I missed a whole bunch of orange on the bottom here underneath his arm here. So I'm just going to throw some orange on there. Again, I'm not going to be particularly precious about this area, though. If there are vines under there, I'm not going to pick them out too preciously because ultimately um, no one's going to see the underside of his armpit. I just want to get some orange on there so it looks like, you know, I didn't miss a spot, but I'm not going to I'm not going to focus too much. Right. Like. I'm going to spend my time on stuff I can see and I can see from the tabletop and, and I'm going to really spend my time there and everything else, I'll get some orange on it and it'll look done enough. <laughs> the chat's saying that they didn't even notice until you mentioned it. So exactly. you must be right. <laughs> That's exactly the point, right? Like, so, so I'll throw some paint on there and, and, you know, I, I might not, I'm, I'm not going to spend the time. If there's a vine there that I miss, I'm not going to stress about it. I'm not going to, worry worry myself over it. I'm not going to kill myself, right? Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is turn your models, like feel free to spin them. Like this, I'm holding this model basically upside down um, right now as I, as I reach into places with my brush that I wouldn't otherwise be, be able to reach into just because, you know, again, this is where I, this is where I'm comfortable holding it. And this is where I know I'm going to be able to, to comfortably apply the paint onto the miniature. So yeah, just don't, don't be, don't feel like, you know, I have a handle. I've got to hold it this way. Um, don't feel like, you know, this is the way the model stands. Therefore I've got to paint it this way. Don't, don't do that. Do what, do what feels comfortable and easy and, and what, what works, right? Um, I think that's the other thing is I can give you all the advice in the world. If it doesn't work for you, you can throw it away. Um, it, Another what, kind what, of nice thing yeah. about these miniatures is that they all come pre-assembled. I know with some yeah. of the miniatures I've painted, they come in about a thousand pieces and I'm always having a hard time deciding if I should put them together first or if I should paint them first and how to do that. But these are just all yeah. going to be put together except for Megazord. His sword is enormous. So that you'll just sort of stick in. But otherwise they all come put together, which is great. Pre-assembled miniatures are some of, oops, some of the best things. Oh, okay. I broke him off his miniature. I'm going to add some glue on, onto him. Um, oh, I, no. I guess, you know. <laughs> Speaking of pre-assembled. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, I guess this is a good time since you mentioned, like, like for gluing on that sword, right? Like, you want to get, like, a nice super glue and just throw it on. Um, and that's all I'm doing right now. Uh, when it comes to, to basing miniatures, again, it it's one of those things where, you know, because these miniatures have solid contact points, they'll stay on. Um, but if you do choose to take them off and do something a little more involved with the bases, you can. You have a lot of uh, freedom to do that. And that's really nice. That's honestly pretty awesome. And it's something that I love because sometimes when you have like a big hunk of plastic stuck on a base, you can't do anything with it. It's kind of frustrating and it's even hard um, to, to navigate around some of those those hunks of plastic. But working with something that's that's as beautifully and dynamically sculpted as these minis are, you know, you have a lot to work with here and there's a lot, a lot of freedom there. Yeah, so let's see here. So yeah, it's, it's pretty, I mean, and I think that's the thing is like, we've got two colors on this model. That's it. No special techniques, no, nothing, nothing fancy. Just I'm 
putting on paint on a model. And that's sometimes that's all you need to do, right? Is just put the paint on the model. Yeah. It also is interesting. So you've only done that one coat of green and it is still a little bit wet, but it's interesting looking at it, almost as highlighting itself because you're not using a thick coat. I'm not like you can actually see uh, where the white is. And I think this is one of the reasons why I often um, I'll often tell people, you know, you know try it on white um, because you can use a thin coat and the, the paint kind of recedes into the cracks and crevices. Um, so it looks more intense and darker in those places. And where it's lighter, it looks uh, on those high points where the paint wasn't able to pull up, it kind of gives you a highlighted effect, right? So it looks like you did more work than you did. Again, a lazy painter showing you the way. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about highlighting and uh, all that other good stuff in a little bit too, I'm sure. Absolutely. We're going to be going into, we're going to be doing a shade and we're going to be doing some some like little highlights. I'm going to sh introduce you to the concept. Um, the idea is when you're highlighting and you're shading, what we're doing at that point is we're, we are painting on the impression of shadow and light, right? Um, because that that scale is a little bit different in the way it interacts with miniatures uh, is different so we exaggerate the shadows and we exaggerate the highlights so they look as if the miniature is to scale with us as as you know fully sized people or you know a scary overly giant pumpkin who can come to life and rap at you while he sends pumpkin headed putty patrol at you because um, <laughs> that's the thing so exciting. Yeah, I think highlighting is one of my favorite techniques that I learned as a painter when I very first started because it takes your miniature from being pretty flat to looking 3D mm -hmm. with almost no skill involved. <laughs> it's, I mean, I think that's the, the thing is it's not like you have to, you shouldn't feel like um, when, when you're painting on your miniature, uh, you shouldn't feel like this, like this is hard. This isn't hard. Um, and I, what I love about painting miniatures is it's really easy for me as like the kind of person that I am. I can't do yoga. I can't sit still for long enough. I can't, you know, I don't, I don't get anything that's not relaxing for me. It's not, it's not my idea of what, um, what I do to, to help me make the world fall away. But when you paint a miniature, you are in the moment, you are focused, you are there. And that's something that, you know, you can do. So you might've noticed, I got a little bit of green on his hand. And what I did is I just washed out my brush and I dabbed it and I pulled most of that paint off. And then I can go back in with a little orange afterwards once it's all dry and touch that up. Um, when you paint with thinner paints, when you're thinning your paints out on your palette, that's a nice thing. They have, they're not so thick that they immediately pigment and stain what you're doing. So it's an easy way to kind of pick up any stray paint um, is just, you know, give your brush a quick rinse out, dry on a paper towel and just pick up with the leftover, um, the leftover moisture. You can pick up that paint and just keep working. So I do not recommend this because I think you should keep the stuff that you paint painted, but we did have a question in the Q and A, you know, what product you would use to completely strip your model. And I know I've used simple green before, but it depends on what kind of plastic and you can really mess your stuff up with that. So do you have any comments about it? So I have done, honestly, uh, the first thing I would do is try to just reprime over it. Like if you, I, I hate doing it. I do. Um, I hate the idea of like going back to zero. Um, but you know, if, if you're in a situation where you're like, ah, man, I really just, I want to, I want to start from scratch, try repriming it. Um, most miniatures because of the, the sculpting detail, um, you can, you can easily reprime something uh, with very minimal loss and you, you're working from there. You don't have to strip it. If you're looking at um, products that that take off paint, it depends on the material of the miniature and depends on the plastic. I'm very reticent to pull paint off of a miniature, but when I've got like a spot that I want to take paint off of, um, I've often just taken a, a swab 
uh, with 99% rubbing alcohol. You can get it at Costco or your pharmacy and swabbed off portions of the miniature that way. Um, you know, you can, you can, you can take most pain off that way. Uh, but I've, I've gone so far as to, to, you know, try to save some, some old metal models uh, with nail polish remover. That stuff is toxic and you can, you can, when you use it, you can really, you can feel it poisoning you as you go. Um, so I don't recommend it. I don't I would say recommend it. This, is, this was a much more common practice when yeah. um, miniatures were made out of metal. And now that yeah. most miniatures are plastic because it's just a better way to make miniatures, it's not mm. as common to strip them. But I know it's like not. I've seen people buy other people's metal miniatures and not like the paint job they did and they want to start over on them and then they strip them for that reason. And it's always a pain. Oh, it's... It's such a, a, a brutal experience. I mean, I, I love minis. I do. I think that, you know, if you can save a miniature and you can continue to love it, do whatever you need to do. But, like, I'm more likely to just reprime and try from there. Um, and you can usually get, get there anyways. A, a model that has paint that is on it so thick, you know, you're almost better just just buying a new model. Just buy yourself some new toys. You know, um, just buy yourself some new toys. It's true. So we did have another good question. Um, enamel paint. So you'll often see these for things like painting miniature cars, um, testers paints. I believe mm. some of them are enamels. I'm not really sure. Yeah. I don't have a lot of experience with them. Um, yeah. I assume that you would recommend acrylics. That's what I've always used. Uh, I, I love acrylic model paint. I think acrylic model paint is, it's a, the way that we moved away from metal miniatures, um, into plastic is, you know, is a technological advancement the same way that acrylic paint is a technological advancement for miniature painters. Um, I like the, the hassle alone of cleaning enamel off of your brushes uh, the fact that you have to use like paint thinners, it's all just, you know, you know, it, it, I, I've joked about like, you know, you live by the brush, you die by the brush, but like, I don't want to die from painting. Like, I don't want, I don't want my exposure to toxics, uh, products, um, to be the thing that kills me. And so like, if I can, if I can do this and not have to worry about, fumes i'm gonna do that i'm gonna choose that that option instead so that's where we are um i've taken a little bit of uh beast hide uh to paint the pumpkin stump at the top here uh just a little bit again um i'm using a wet palette so it's you know it's got a little bit of moisture on there and the paint is coming off pretty thin and i'm pretty happy with it so i'm just gonna paint that on while we we chat a little bit um is there any let, do you have any other questions it looks like yeah, Curtis did ask about enamels. Um, I think that that like when we look at the products that are available to us as hobbyists, uh, the ones that give you the results you're looking for, that are easy to get, like you know, stick to the ones that 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 are easy and also like non-toxic. Like these paints make a point to say like it conforms to toxicity, like things, right? Um, you know, they're formulated for that. They're formulated so that they don't poison you as you go. Um, and and that, that's kind of what you want. Absolutely. You want to be safe. <laughs> but there are yeah, just a few good brands. Like, I've used P3 paints for most of the time I've painted. I really like those. Mm -hmm. Citadel paints are amazing. And there's so many color choices that you can really yeah. get pretty insane with them. And that's fun. Yeah. Um, there's also Army Painter. I really like their line. As far as really, really bright colors, especially because our rangers are a little bit different than your typical fantasy paint colors, is there a paint line that you would recommend checking out for those really intense bright colors? There's some there's some um, brands out there, like uh, a lot of hobby stores carry lines from a company called Vallejo. Mm, Vallejo um, they great. actually, they make a, their line is massive. Um, they have so many different color paints. And another another company you'll find in the model kind of world that also has like really crazy colors um, 
a crazy paint range is Reaper. They make a lot of miniatures as well. So like like most hobby stores will carry, you know, at least some of their products and, and you can find those paints out there as well. Um, honestly though, even if like when we're working with these colors, the, the intensity, you could probably find them somewhere. You can probably find them. You probably add a little bit of um, pink. Like if you want to make your own pink, it's really just like we learned this in grade school, red and white, and you could find that, that way to get there too. So even if you don't have access to that crazy range out there, um, if you have a, you know some good quality model paints on hand, um, you can get there. You can absolutely get there. You know, obviously it's it's nice to have something straight out of the bottle, but at the same time, there's there's economical options out there. Uh, if you're just like, I'm gonna, you know, take some solid basic colors, uh, you know, a red, a blue, a green, a, a yellow, and and you know, work work from there and, and see what I can do. And you can absolutely do. Um, Jamie's asking about a recommendation for a super tiny detail brush. Um, I I'm not going to lie, I. I hate detail brushes. I do. I I despise them. I feel like I'm painting with like a cat whisker. They don't hold paint. Like when we talk about brush qualities that I love in a brush, um, my favorite brushes are rather sizable brushes. This is like a size two. Um, this is like a, a re this is a ridiculously old, like I have brushes. This is a decade old brush. that has got the old Citadel label on it. I don't know if people know how long ago Citadel made red handled brushes, but it was <laughs> it was a long time ago. Man, that might um, have been before I started my store. That's a really <laughs> old brush. <laughs> it's a really, it is a really old, oh, I was, I, uh, this brush came with me from university and I'm not gonna disclose how long ago it was, but but it's it's quite a while, you know. Um, and And for me, a good brush, you don't need a super, tiny brush you just need a brush with a good tip and that's the difference is a brush with a good tip will do as much work as a, as a small brush but it will hold more paint which means that it will last longer uh, because the paint won't dry on it won't dry in it and it won't break the bristles or or mess up your ferrule which is up here because um, when paint dries in there it tends to splay the brushes out so that's what we're we're looking at um i do like army painter makes a line of great brushes so does like citadel they make a line of really great brushes but when you're shopping for a brush look at the tips just just look at them see see you know does this look you know solid um and and am i happy with that great that's that's all you need you don't need a ton um of like fancy expensive brushes just you know go to your hobby store they they probably have great brushes a lot of people use those brushes and you can get great results with them um, oh, and Jamie does mention she's using an eyeliner brush. Those work. Listen, makeup brushes are fantastic. I, if you actually look um, here, I, this is my dry brush. This is an e.l.f. contour brush. This is a $3 eyeshadow brush from, like, you can get it at Walmart or Target or whatever. Um, and I love this dry brush. This is the best dry brush ever. I think it's fantastic. Um, and... And I recommend it to everyone who's like looking for a dry brush because you will ruin your dry brush. The, you will ruin it and then you'll throw it away when you spend like three bucks on one. You don't feel as bad when you do it. Um, and this is like, this is what I've been pulling paint out of my, my uh, pots with. Um, and this is also a makeup brush. Uh, this is like, I think this is the same company, e.l.f. Um, it's a silicone glitter applicator. You actually look that's what it's called i use it to pull paint out of my brush it's a nice silicone brush uh i mix water with it i um and for me it's just something i can use to pull um pull paint out of a pot um the when you pull paint out of a pot with a brush uh sometimes you can get paint up in that barrel and we talked about that and why that's bad um <laughs> if you use something like this it's a little bit easier to avoid wrecking your brushes and you can make them last as long as apparently I have, so. I do always recommend to people who are brand new to painting to not spend a lot of money on brushes to start with because the chance that you'll wreck them is pretty high. <laughs> Once you know That's what true. you're doing, if you really want to spend some more money on them, but you really don't need to when you start. No, I mean, again, like your, your paint will have more of an effect on the outcome than your brush. So 
spend the money on paint. Um, mm -hmm. And and you can like I I've painted for years um, using you know just craft brushes, uh, and they had good points, right? Like you know that's that's all you're looking for when you're starting out. Typically, uh, you get good value out of like synthetic brushes um, because they'll maintain their point. Uh, for quite a bit, and and they're easy to work with, um, but you know you can you can kind of go go a lot of places after that. As you develop as a as a painter, you'll learn your style. You also learn um, you'll also learn what what works for you as a painter, right? Again, we're talking about like my style is I I'm lazy. I like painting fast. I use big <laughs> brushes. That's that's my style. But if you are someone who really you know, is looking for that perfect detail brush, right? Like, it's hard for me not to recommend the $30 Windsor & Newton, like, you know, <laughs> crazy 2.0 brush out there. It, and it's a beautiful brush. And it I know a lot of people who love it, but it's not one I own or think is 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 right for me, right? And they're but, difficult to know, find anyway. <laughs> they're so difficult to find. Kalinsky yeah. Sable has all this, like, there's customs mm -hmm. issues with it. Like it's it's a whole mess. Um, what I'm doing now is I'm pulling from the uh, Fuegan Orange shade bottle and I'm putting it onto a dry palette here. This is a 25 cent tile I got from the hardware store um, that I use as my dry palette. Uh, so I'll put paints on here when I'm dry brushing um, or washes that I want to keep uh, kind of their, at their at their pigmentation level so I don't want to thin them out. So washes tend to spread a little bit on a wet palette, they make a mess. And on the soil, I'll often put them on a, a, a palette like this and apply them that way. So um, this is Fuegan Orange. I pull my washes out of my bottle, close the lid and then apply. I know a lot of people like to dip the brush directly into the wash and go, but um, if you've been around the internet for long enough, you've seen pictures of someone with one of these tall bottles spilled all over their lap or something terrible. And it's a lot of product to like lose in one go. And it's a heartbreaker. It's a heartbreaker. So I've had bottles so, like, explode on me, like the dropper bottles. Oh, yeah. I really like these ones, the paint pops, because they just have paint in them and they come out. We use the dropper yeah. bottles. If you squeeze really hard, it's clogged up or something. I've had those. Explode. Oh, <laughs> I have, I have, uh, repurposed a shirt for a zombie shirt when uh, it wasn't even me. It was like one of my friends was trying to squeeze some red paint out of a bottle and it went everywhere. <laughs> so yeah, that was, that was a thing that happened. And I mean, we all have stories, right? Like, you know, uh, they're like, like painting survival tips, right? Like keep up. If you're using dropper bottles, keep a pin with you. Mm -hmm. Cause like, like, or, or a, a you know, a paper clip. I've seen people use just to clear out the nozzles sometimes. Don't squeeze harder. Squeezing harder is the wrong answer. Um, so let us know what you're doing right now. Um, you're applying the wash. So what's going on? I'm just on? applying the wash straight. So all we're doing is we're applying this wash. And what I'm doing is I'm keeping the wash kind of thin. So as I put it on, if I see puddling, what I'll do is I'll, I'll give my brush a rinse and I'll take it clean with a little bit of moisture and I'll pull it away so it doesn't puddle too terribly much. I'm not, I'm not trying to get puddles I'm just trying to to apply it into the recesses so where it's puddling I'll pull it away and we'll keep going now again I'm not being especially worried about like getting it on the green because what what that happens what that does when those two colors meet uh they ultimately just make a shadow and I'm okay with that uh we're gonna be painting highlights on top anyways so as long as the impression of green is still there and this wash is not going to wash away the green um we're good we're solid so yeah, I'm painting it on. I'm painting it as thin as I can. Now, one of the things that I tend to do is I'll try to work um, so that where the wash ends up is where I want it to be, like vertically. So I'm working with gravity here because uh, the wash does sometimes run. Um, so when I paint the pumpkin head, I'm going to turn him upside down and paint him that direction. Um, so again, I'm working with gravity for the way the, the wash will flow so that I'm just not ending up with puddles of wash along his neck here. The wash is very thin. If you haven't worked with it before, it's just barely more viscous than water. Yeah, it's very, very thin. And like sometimes they have a medium uh, in there to, to help it stick a little bit. But I find like, especially this wash here, it's a lot on the, it's more on the thinner side. Some brands have a, a thicker kind of consistency to them. 
Um, so one of the washes that I have here is uh, the Army Painter ink wash. This is the bottle version. Um, it's it's got a bit of a thicker consistency, um, whereas this this particular wash from Citadel is is very very thin. So when you apply it, it's you just want to make sure you're not over applying it so that uh, you're getting puddles on there because then it looks splotchy. Um, and you just want to you know just throw it on where basically I'm putting it on all of the orange um, because there's so much detail in the vine work here and in in all the places. Now, if you're finding that there's some spots on the model that you didn't hit so well with the brush, sometimes the wash also helps with that too. It creates a shadow. Again, shadows are where your brush wouldn't be able to reach anyways. And, you know, you can keep moving forward. You don't have to feel like you have to go back with, with your base color and get in there really hard because chances are nobody's going to see it anyway. So the, the shade can do some work to you. Um, so this is a really great step and it helps Again, it helps the process be a little more forgiving, right? So, so we had doing. a question in chat for you. Um, so Andrew is thinking ahead about painting his putties, which makes sense because most of the models, well, not necessarily most of them, a lot of the models you're going to get are going to be putties, either regular ones or super putties. How do you get that clay-like look on them? Are you going to be doing a lot of dry brushing? Is there a certain type of paint that you really recommend for that? I am going to be, honestly, I'm probably going to prime the putties black mm -hmm. and and dry brush layers of gray on them and, you know, be done with it. Um, they're not, because uh, they're so gray, right? You want a little bit, if you want a little bit of shadow on there, you can put a little bit of, you can put a little bit of a, a like a, a, a black wash on there, uh, uh, the Army Painter makes a dark wash. I would thin that down quite a bit so it doesn't, you know, end up in places you don't want it to be, uh, kind of blocking up colors. But ultimately, um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to just dry brush them and just, you know, enjoy them that way because they, they'll they'll paint up really fast. You'd be surprised how far dry brushing can go um, with with the mi miniatures um, because again they're so detailed, right? Uh, so they'll, they'll carry paint well. Definitely. And you can even do it with a couple colors. Like you don't have to, you don't have to buy a bunch of shades of gray. Just mix some white with some black. Um, <laughs> and you'll be surprised. You'll be, you'll be surprised. So I'm, you know, throwing in the wash on the head now. Again, I turned them upside down. So I'm working with gravity a little bit. I don't have to fight too much uh, in terms of like trying to keep the paint or the, the shade out of the vines. Because as soon as it runs into the vines, um, it'll spread downwards pretty quickly. And so that's something I just want to be a little bit mindful of. Um, and that's it. There you go. Now we have the wash. And again, we're going to let it dry. Nice. It takes a we little bit of time. Steve Holt, who I assume that is not your real name, if you've watched Arrested Development, um, he is saying hi to you, Carrie. <laughs> uh, Steve is... Um, <laughs> Steve is the gentleman who I believe painted the miniatures for you guys, actually. Uh, so I know that if you were at Morphicon or at Gen Con, you might have seen some painted miniatures in the Renegade booth case. Steve is the one who painted them up, and he is he is an incredible painter, very fast. And yeah, <laughs> it's one of those things where, where as you develop as a painter over time, um, you learn to become faster. You learn to become... Um, more proficient with the tools you have, right? And you learn and develop your own methods that make painting work for you, right? And Steve is one of those people who just knows. Uh, did I put wash on the vines? No, I did not put wash on the vines, Joseph. Um, I've got a different wash for the vines, um, and that's this green tone ink here. So yeah. why did you pick a different wash for those vines? Um, I picked a, a different wash for the vines because I didn't want to make them too muddy. So what happens is when you look at the colors we're working with, green and orange, in the shadows where they touch, it's fine because you do have a little bit of shade, but it turns really brown and muddy really quickly. And I didn't want to put the orange wash on the green, um, making them look browner. I want that that cartoony exaggeration a little bit. Um means that you have a more intense kind of color. So things that would look more realistic 
um, with the Browns in say our world, in that hyper-realistic, you know, cartoony verse that is Power Rangers universe, those colors are just even more exaggerated. So using a, a green shade for the green vines, you know, gives me a little bit of, of control over the shadows without muddying that, that color. So I don't want to get too far ahead of you, but Corey in chat was wondering about the difference between dry brushing and wet brushing, if you want to talk about that just a little bit. So um, dry brushing, when I see dry brushing used, um, it's mostly as a very quick way to um, deposit paint on the highest points of a miniature. Um, when we are talking about like like putting the and applying this 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 paint in this manner, what we're doing is we're taking the paint, we're taking most of it off the brush, we're we're drying the paint out so when you brush it on it's not depositing evenly it's depositing in just where the it is being pressed the most which is the highest ridges and the highest points um, with a dry brush when we use wet brushing there's a lot of different techniques that use like wet brushes uh two brush blending uh wet blending um those are different techniques that that uh essentially you know you know, spread the paint out. I've seen other, you know, terms for that. Like uh, if if you're talking about a different technique that uses the term wet brushing, that might not be familiar with. But when when I think of uh, wet brush techniques, it's often associated with um, thinning out paints or blending paints together as they're wet um, so that the, the transitions between them is extremely smooth. And they both have their uses, right? So, you know, Wet brushing is a little more advanced. Dry brushing is something anyone can do. I had my daughter dry brushing at five years old. Um, <laughs> yep. So it, it's something you can absolutely do. Um, uh, wet brushing, you you have to have, I feel like you, you there, it's a great technique once you've developed an intuition and understanding for how your paint flows and how the viscosities of paint kind of work um, together. To, to kind of blend together and and understanding that if you if you if you're new to painting um trying to do wet blending is is crazy it's a whole different thing you need to have a, a you all you need to have an a fluency of paint that 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 you know you don't have unless you spent some time putting paint on a miniature um and observing how it goes so that's something here so like wet blending, um, an example of that is if you have like a cape and it starts out, let's say like orange down here and you want it to be a really, really bright, like flame red over here, you would wet yeah. blend some of those colors in between so that that transitions very smooth. And an example absolutely. of dry brushing is like, if you have, let's say I had bison, I played Trollbloods um, oh. in Privateer Press and they have a lot of fur. And so that really, mm -hmm. the top part of the fur, if you take a brush and you just get a little bit of kind of light lighter colored paint on the top of that fur, it stands out and it gives it more of a 3D effect. Especially on like, you'll, you'll probably see dry brushing techniques um, on the weapons of the Rangers. You're looking at um, metal um, and metallics are one of my favorite things to dry brush. They, they are, they look better when you apply them in using a dry brushing than um, typically when you just apply them as if they're a standard paint. It, it, the way that the, the metallic particles collect just looks better when you dry brush. And it allows you to paint things that you wouldn't normally think you could paint um, metallic without looking flat, like uh, highly textured armor, chain nails, that sort of thing. You know, that technique is like one of my go-tos. I love it. Um, and I use it for just about every one of my metallics for sure. So we actually had a question about Goldar because, of course, he's a big chunk of metal in the show. So how would you recommend going about approaching that model? Um, I would prime Goldar black uh, to start, mm -hmm. and I would work up the golds in layers of dry brushing um, and, and work that way because ultimately, and I do the, the metals first, honestly, when, when I... Uh, when I do anything with a, a significant amount of metal, a lot of the model is metal. Um, I'll do the metals first and the metal gets 
everywhere. You'll know how I talked about how messy I am in the first base coat steps. When you dry brush your metallics, your metals are your base coat. And so it gets everywhere. And then you can repaint the black on top of that where you, where you need to and pick out the rest of the details. But a lot of that gold, you can work up um, from like a, a darker silver and then work up into a kind of darker gold and then do a, a, a highlight either with um, a mix of that that darker gold you used and a little bit of silver, or you can just, you know, find a, a brighter silver and just go. So you're, you're, you're laughing, you know, there's a lot of options when it comes to metallics um, and, and applying them. Um, and so, you know, find a metallic that works for you. I, I tend to dry brush with them. So I'll put them on a dry palette and just apply them. But that's how I would generally approach Goldar because he's got, he's got so much gold. And painting gold any other way, it's so easy to look flat. Um, the other thing that I would do before you do that last highlight is I put a little bit of a wash on top of the metal to help it, you know, mm -hmm. again, give it a little more definition before you put that final highlight, again, with a dry brush on and you're good to go. Cool. So what's next for our pumpkin wrapper? All right. So I have, I was, I've been waiting for this wash to dry here uh, again. We spend a lot of time waiting for paint to dry when we paint minis. Um, <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> because ultimately we don't want to have, um, especially when you're at the wash stage, we don't have two washes touched because they'll just bleed into each other and it just makes a hot, holy mess of of paint. And, and that muddies all the colors. Um, but I can start, it looks like I can start putting on some gold or some, sorry, some green onto the uh, onto the green vines. And I'm gonna start at the bottom again because that's where I put the, that's where I started with the shades and then work my way up. Um, and, and you know, again, I'm, I'm gonna try to keep this, you know, I'm, I'm kind of focusing where the, these washes go, but I'm not gonna be precious, especially around the knees. Uh, if you look at Pumpkin Wrapper and how, you know, how his coloring worked, there were a lot of mo modeled and mixed colors across his, his costume um across his character design especially around the knees so again i'm not going to be too concerned and this green is a little bit of a more viscous wash than the citadel wash so it will stick a little bit better in those those areas as we go so that's one thing that you can do while you're waiting for your models to get here is go and watch all the episodes of your favorite characters again and really look at their costumes this time and get an idea of what you want to do when you're painting them. It's 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 a great thing and also like it just I I love you know catching up with them because it's it's always the thing where you're just like I you know I I kind of knew but I didn't quite think that pumpkin wrapper was as hilarious as he was right like he's just and it, it brought me so much joy and going back and like seeing your favorite your favorite um characters on the screen it's, it's always a good thing to do any excuse is a good excuse that's right. basically what i'm saying <laughs> um so i'm applying the green here and just throwing it on onto the vines and you'll see that it it doesn't change too much the the color of of these vines here but it is sinking right in and it's making those impressions of shadow even more pronounced. And that's what really we're pulling doing. out. You can tell the difference between each one of those vines a little bit more, even now and you just barely yeah. started. And so it's, it, and it's not, I'm not using a ton of wash here. Like my, my, my puddle wasn't especially large. Um, and I'm just, just throwing it on. Um, and it's it's pretty straightforward. Again, I'm trying to to focus where those shadows are, and I'll put a little bit more, like in that bow there, or in these these cross hat, like in the backs here. Um, I'm also going to take a little bit more, and I'm going to um, I'm going to put it in the recesses of his face. Um, and the reason why I'm doing this is yes, there's orange in there, and so the green will actually look more like a brown. Um, and I'm going to mix a little bit of that, 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 uh, orange shade in there. Oh, and you man. can see how it's fancy it. now. <laughs> now we're mixing yeah. colors now. Yikes. <laughs> this, is, this is not crazy. This is you know, just a little bit and just throw it in there. Again, the washes are still really forgiving. 
but it will make that, that mouth a little more pronounced. And as I go, like I'm using a huge brush on here. Like I'll, I'll be the first to admit, but you can see as I go, I make a mistake. I just wipe it off. That's it's the best wet. thing about inks and washes is that you can really just wipe them off with a paper towel. <laughs> so yeah, you're good to go. Yet. <laughs> you're good to go. So it's not, it's not like, you know, this isn't anything crazy or not doing anything fancy. It's just a little bit of green wash, a little bit of that orange wash. You still have it on your palette. Just, you know, just throw it on and you're good and you're good. Um, and so I'm just going to add this wash up in here, a little bit of less the last of my green and throw it on and we're solid so there there we are we have most of him done you can see though right like you could stop here and be very happy with him right like you could you could be um you could you could call him done and we at this point this is basically two colors and two washes that's it that's all we've done. You know, we're going to do a little bit more, but if you want to stop here, you're, you're, you've got the character. He's color blocked. He's got everything he needs and, and you're pretty happy. So, um, he looks this, awesome. Yeah. He, he, he looks amazing already. If you think he looks pretty awesome, let us know. <laughs> yeah. Rangers. All right. Um, I, you know, we're we're at a point where uh, we're gonna let him dry uh, a little bit, um, but you know, again, that green is gonna dry. But I'm gonna we're gonna start doing a little bit of of those highlights, right? So I'm gonna start with this necrotech green, and I'm gonna mix that color for you. And I'm gonna show you just how easy this color mixing is because it's not complicated. It's, no, and this is the, the thing I want to emphasize when it comes to highlights. I like to try to keep a little bit of that base color in there so the colors marry together. So I've got a little bit of that necrotite green and I'm going to put it in the puddle where I had my, um, my base coat green. And I'm just going to put it up and add it in so it looks a little bit lighter. And by marrying those two colors, it makes the highlight look like it belongs on there instead of just having a different green on top. Um, and and that's what we're going to be using as the highlight for for pumpkin wrapper. And now I didn't put a wash on this vine really, and so I'm going to start with there because I know that's dry. And I'm going to just basically take that green and throw it on top. And this this is highlighting. This is it. This is where. I look at the model and say, where would light hit? And there's the green. Um, and we're not, again, this is not about like ma ma making, like filling in the lines. This is not coloring. It's more like paint by number, right? When you paint a miniature, it's paint by number. And what we're doing is we're trying to keep it inside of where that first green is and just painting a thin, basically a thin line on top. So. So if you're you're filling in a thin area for the vines, I'm just painting a thinner green line on every vine, just like that, with this this color. And that is my highlight on the vines. It's nothing complicated or fancy. And you don't have to do it on every vine. Oh my goodness, that would, you know, you do it to the point where you're looking at the miniature books. Ah, I'm happy with that, and you can be done. So Terry, we've had some very important requests for you. <gasps> Um, okay. We just barely unlocked the uh, Hero Ranger Slayer, which is a pretty big deal for our fans. And yes. they were wondering if you could do a pumpkin wrap to celebrate. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, so I had written a whole bunch out. Um, let me see. I know you were very I, prepared for this. <laughs> I was, I like, I penned, like, I don't know if it was like just excitement or, or <laughs> me, uh, you know, breathing in too much primer fumes earlier or, or what it was, but like the, the idea of doing a pumpkin wrap, it's so exciting to me. I even wrote them in like orange pen. Um, <laughs> You're hilarious. <laughs> so like, uh, here, here, here's one. Um, Pumpkin spice lattes might totally be hip, but the thought of drinking this guy kind of makes me sick. 
<laughs> That's oh, amazing. <laughs> oh dear. That's pretty We good. got another backer. That's uh, let's give a cheer getting through that stretch goal. That's what I hear. <laughs> Did you just make that up? <laughs> I, I yes. I, I've got a few, like again, but like um, <laughs> I, I I was really excited. Pumpkin wrapper. I I think that when <laughs> when it comes to like like just leaning into this universe, right? Like um, leaning into this universe is one of the things that I that I really love, right? It it is fun and crazy. And yes, the Green Ranger plays a sword like it's a flute without taking his helmet off. <laughs> you know, and it sounds like a synthesizer trying to be a trumpet. That is fantastic. That's what makes it joyous right so that's so fun I, I think that that to me that it's just another way to to kind of celebrate um celebrate this so uh i i stopped a little bit because i wanted to make sure the screen was dry before i i went in again with another you know just a quick highlight and again what we're doing here this is this is the i i specifically created and and worked through these processes to try to make it as beginner friendly as possible right like you could stop at the shades and you know be very happy with them he looks very good um but if you keep going you can play with these other techniques and kind of get a feel for how paint works now when i thin my paint for a highlight i tend to take it a little thinner than i did with my base coat and the reason I'm doing that is because you kind of want a little bit of transparency on it. And so when you when you have that tiny bit of transparency, it also helps marry the colors so they don't look like they're just this weird, um, weird layers to them. And so all I'm doing is just, you can see this half of the mini has a little bit of the green added in. And this half here, I haven't done any highlighting to it. And And you can see a little bit of the difference. It's these little... Uh, touches and little techniques that that you know add just that little bit more light and a little bit more shadow a little bit more dimension to your your miniature so you mentioned that you thin this out a little bit more than you did with your regular base coat paint but you're doing it on a wet palette so how do you modify how wet it is when you're working that way so I just add more water on top I'll, I'll take my my uh, paint scooper brush I'll add a couple drops next mm. to my palette so i'll see you know about that i'll mix it in and i'll pull my paint um when you pull your paint it just means like taking a little bit of your paint and pulling it into a line now you'll notice this paint it 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 streams and beads that's an indication that it's thin um when i did a pull of the orange it was a solid line right you can get uh and get a sense of how thick paint is based on how it behaves when you pull it into a line and and that's that's one of those things where you develop that knowledge and understanding from literally painting miniatures you add like you know time at the table is where well you'll you'll you can see it like you can have someone explain it to you but ultimately it's it's the time you spend painting at the table that will give you that that almost intuitive knowledge of how this paint will behave and whether it's there or not. Um, but, you know, play with your paint, add, add water to it, see what happens, uh, you know, see, see what effects you, you can get with it. See, see how thin or thick it is. If it's not thin enough, um, add more water. If it's too, if it's too thick or if it's uh, too thin, add more paint. Um, so well, why are you, so you're highlighting by painting each little area very, very carefully, fairly carefully. <laughs> fairly carefully. I mean, I why, think that's the Why are you doing that instead of dry brushing, since we talked about dry brushing earlier? Okay, so I did that because I painted the orange first, right? Um, I try to dry brush uh, working into lighter colors, right? So the green, even if this green is on here, Dry brush is a dry brushing can be a really messy, messy process. Um, it it gets paint everywhere, and it's it like even if you're very careful, um, if you're doing it in this way, um, dry brushing can still be just just hard to handle. And if you're using too small a brush, um, 
it can look really chalky and uneven and it it can be it can turn on you really quick if you're not if you're not doing it as a first step and or as an early step or as a very specific kind of place and because this model the way the the colors are on this model and the way he's blocked out it's it's harder to get as good a result just touching my brush onto the highest points and that's the thing is i'm not like very carefully picking it up um, when you learn to paint, you'll learn that there are different sides to your brush. So there's the tip, which you, you know, you hold, basically you're holding nine degrees to the section, but there's also the side. And when you paint with the side of the brush, you get more coverage. What I'm essentially doing is I'm taking the side of my brush and I'm just touching it and it will pick up the, it'll deposit the paint, but I don't need to be specific because these are the highest points. So it'll just autumn the paint will automatically deposit without me having to like try to feel like I've got to like control it and put it on with my tip. I'm just taking the side of my brush and by taking the side of my brush and just laying it on. I barely touch the model with the side of my brush, but it just deposits. That's really great um, advice. I think that makes it a lot easier to get it where you want it. Absolutely. And again, cause we're not depositing this paint in a very like heavy handed way. We're thinning it out and you're barely touching the model. And, but you're using the side of your brush. And so in learning, in learning how to find those different, um, the different tips of your brush, you can learn the, the brush control, the, the little bits where you, you, you feel like, you know, I, I, can, I can handle this, right? So if you paint with the side of your brush, you can deposit the paint without actually like feeling like you have to control every tiny little line. And that's ultimately what we're doing here. We're just depositing with the side of our brush and it's just, depositing on the highest point so awesome. i'm not being i'm not i'm not being very if you if you actually look i'm not being super careful um and i'm not i don't have this model up against my nose because then you just see the back of my head um so <laughs> it's a it, it it feels like it like when you when you think about it um it might seem like it's a really challenging you know tiny detail pick picky thing but what you're actually doing is you're kind of being a little haphazard and letting it be a little haphazard. When you paint with the side of your brush to do these highlights, you kind of want to be a little bit haphazard in the sense that where the paint deposits is where light's going to be because those are the highest points. Keep moving forward. It's awesome. All right, so that's where we are with his green. And we're going to do uh, the same. And we're going to mix a little bit of, um, you know what, actually, I think I'm going to do this with just, just a little bit of the yellow. Um, and we're gonna go kind of, kind of straight. So there's the yellow, and I'm gonna thin this out quite significantly. So you highlighted the green, and now we're gonna be highlighting the orange. That yeah, does look very do bright. A, <laughs> it is, it is a very golden yellow. Um, Hearth Fire is a very, it isn't a neon yellow, but it's a very rich yellow. It's got a lot of golden hues to it, and it's quite light. Um, and when it's on white, it looks crazy. But I'm going to show you just how transparent it is. It, it doesn't like actually coat. This isn't supposed to look as though it's it's super pigmented or super, super, um, super thick. And you can see when I pull, it beads almost immediately. This is almost the consistency of water. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of that yellow and I'm going to just add in a few striations here. Um, of the yellow on on the pumpkin's head here. So just a touch here and touch here and touch here. And it adds a little bit of dimension to the orange. And that's what we're looking for is just a little bit of, of, of light. And so the orange itself doesn't look too flat. And there we go. And just on the top, this isn't anything special or I'm not doing anything particularly precious. And, and I'm just throwing it in again, kind of the same points where I'm just adding a few, few lines. If you think of it like that, I'm just adding a few lines of yellow, very thin yellow, very transparent yellow on there. So it just makes of, this pumpkin look a little more pumpkin-y. It does. Um, one of our backers is asking about transparent paints. Have you worked with those and why are you using this instead of a transparent paint? Um, I find that like, so when I work with transparent paint, um, 
and I've seen them. They've they've had different like there are some model paints out there that have like a transparency value on the the bottle. Um, I find that you can get a very similar effect by thinning your paints down. Mm-hmm. Um, and so all all those products are are a less pigmented paint with more filler and more binder and. Um, if I can make one paint work in multiple applications, I'm more likely I'm going to do that than I am going to going to um, just just add the the buy a specific paint for a specific type. I know that, for example, a lot of people really love the Citadel dry paints, right? Um, and they're great if you're just um, if you're if you are the kind of person who wants that color. It's perfect, but um. I'd rather have a paint that I can use in multiple ways. So a paint that I can do highlights with, that I can dry brush with, that I can do base coats with, um, because I feel like I'm getting a little more value and then I can spend more money on my toys um, rather than on different bottles of the same shade of paint. Um, so that's, you know, that's a personal preference thing. If something works for you though, use it. Absolutely. Like that, uh, you know, the best paint is the one that that works, that makes you happy. It's the one that that gives you the effect you want. Um, so like, you know, for me, uh, I just realized I didn't put a shade on this orange. Um, for me, I, I want to, uh, I like to use paints that have multiple uses, but you know, some people just like having a very specific, um, paint that they use for a very specific purpose. Um, and, and if it works for them, totally, that, that's absolutely perfect. Like you don't have to paint the way I the way I paint, right? Um, grow beyond me, please, actually. Uh, <laughs> well, one thing I, to paint. I used to see people who were painting, let's say like a games workshop army where you would have 30 or 40 of this exact same guy and they wanted all of them to look exactly the same. And so they would buy a more specialized type paint like the transparent paints or something like that because they wanted that consistency over all their models. But when you're sitting down and painting like you're doing right now, you're going to get through this whole model in one sitting. So you don't have to worry about matching your paint three days later. So that's that's one thing I've seen and would recommend that type of paint for. Exactly. I mean, I think that if you, a lot of those single bottle paints, like if you use them in a, you know, like a a conveyor belt sort of way, Mm -hmm. you know, they work great for, for, for getting everything consistent. That's perfect. Right. Um, I like to paint games with a lot of characters in them. And so I tend to try to, to uh, paint, paint them even, even when I do my batches, I paint them so that my mixed batches are individual different models. And then, I'll do a different batch and they'll be slightly different the next batch after that. So that's, I put a little bit of, um, of that yellow on the pumpkin up here. And I put a little bit of yellow again on the top of his head and on the tips of his boots here. But honestly, you can keep going. You can find little points to pick out. You could probably pick out his little knuckles here if you wanted to, like using the side of your brush, if you wanted to like, like add, add a little bit of highlight on there. Again, I'm not pinpointing this as if it's a pen, I'm using the side of my brush to deposit that little bit of paint and a little bit of yellow on his hand. Um, but ultimately, I think he looks pretty good at this stage. And, you know, and we're there. We're already wow. there. That was and so it's fast. quick. <laughs> and all you need to do, all, and after this, you can paint your base. Um, again, I used the same color on the stub as I did for the base because that was the paint I had it on hand. But you can you can paint it however you want. You can make all of your miniatures match at the end. Like that's one thing that that when I when I paint um, game sets, I like to have all the minis have their bases match. So it looks like they're all sharing the same ground. Um, and that's completely up to you. And so that is that that's pumpkin wrapper. My name is Pumpkin yeah. Rapper, and I'm here to say you can paint me any which way. <laughs> <laughs> so good. <laughs> so there we are. Um, yeah. So hopefully, hopefully that's uh, I've answered some of your guys' questions. Um, I'm so, going to show you some of the minis I do have. I know I've, I've yeah I've, we've uh, spoken of them. Well, um, and you're going to, you're going to be painting again for us, right? I am. I'm making um. I'm going to be making some painting tutorials for 
the Rangers. So these, Yay. let me change the focus here so you guys can actually see them. I'll move my palettes out of the way now that we're done with the paints. Um, and let me get these guys out here. So I have... So Terry is going to be working on some painting video tutorials. It won't be yeah. live. Um, we hopefully answered a lot of your questions this time, but she'll do a really deep dive into exactly how to paint these. And we'll be posting those later and make sure all of you backers get that info. And along Absolutely. with lists of colors that you might want to use, some recommendations to help you guys out and give you some first steps. Absolutely. So here we are. I've got, I've got all of, uh the the five rangers um so i'm i'm really excited to to be doing these guys up i'm i i'll be i'll be posting the videos very soon so yeah uh you'll see them up on my youtube channel um there and if you find me on social media you can also check them out but like you can i don't know if you guys have have uh shown these miniatures like but they are beautiful they are so like delightfully detailed um, but they're also not like so detailed that you feel super overwhelmed painting them. So they're going to be, they're going to wear paint beautifully. They're going to wear washes beautifully. The most basic techniques will take you there. Now, what I'm, I, I believe, like these are not primed. Um, the ones I got, I, I believe that these are just the resins um, because they're in pre-production. Um, when you get yours in the mail, they'll be the colors. I believe that's what you said, Sarah. Yeah, so they'll be in the correct ranger colors. And the, it was actually the plastic will be that color. So they won't mm -hmm. be painted. You'll still want to prime them. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, give them a good prime. But yeah, I'm super excited to get them to get them in and get them colored. Um, so yeah, these are these are really they're they're so great. And you can actually see the scale of them compared to to the, the pumpkin wrapper, right? Like they're they're pretty sizable. These are beefy. Um, minis too. So, so I'm really excited to to, sh to show you guys because there's a lot of the colors are just going to be so beautiful on these. I think that's the big thing. Is like, oh, they're going to pop. That's going to be fun. Yeah. So we'll make sure we get those up for you guys in not too much longer. Um, yeah. The, as soon as she gets a chance, and then we'll be sending those out to you through um, either the updates or maybe even emails, depending on where we're at with the campaign. Yeah. Um, if you're also looking to kind of keep up with me, I'll be posting like works in progress uh, as we get through to get you kind of seeing the steps. Um, you can find me on Instagram. Uh, oh, we're missing I'm, a bit of it. We're oops. off. The, the, there we go. we go. There we go. <laughs> Instagram. Um, I'm that Terry girl. And I'm also there on Twitter. Um, and you can find me on Facebook. They are also Gamer Terry. asking if you're doing any monsters or if you're just doing the Rangers. And I actually don't remember. I have these are well, I have this pumpkin wrapper. He's the only uh, villain I have. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, we never know what the future holds. I'm hoping that ultimately, you know, I can show you guys more tips and tricks and techniques. Um, you know, and so right now, these are the guys I have, but you know, you never know what's in the future, right? Like I'm not a fortune teller. I, you know, if you, if you're in the chat and you are a fortune teller, you know, send me a message, please. I would love to hear from you. Um, I've or, got some lottery tickets to buy. Or if you're in the chat and you really like this video and you want to see more from Terry, you should let us know about that. That might be useful. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's true too. That, that won't work. Um, but yeah, I'm so excited. I'm so Thankful to you, uh, Sarah, you at Renegade, um, everyone at Renegade, honestly, because um, this this was so much fun, and it just uh, being able to to write these really terrible raps um, brought me joy <laughs> in a way that, like, you know, you, there's there's nothing quite like it, um, and and yeah, I'm really I'm really excited to get more. Nice. And well, thank you Corey. so much. And um, Terry, this was amazing. Uh, Steve, thanks for jumping in the chat and answering some great questions too. And for everybody in chat for asking really good questions. I think it's wonderful to see so much excitement about painting. I think it's a really fun hobby. And uh, I can't wait to see what you guys do. So once you get your models and start painting them, you'll definitely have to post those so we can all see them and share in that excitement. But thank you, Terry. We will be watching very closely and waiting for your next videos. It's going to be awesome.
Thank you guys so much. Have a good one. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye.